Hello, so this is uh, video number one of section 4.1. So you might remember um, at the beginning of the course or at some point when we started talking about vectors, I had mentioned that um, there's sort of this more abstract way of defining what a vector is. And so in this lecture, I want to convince you that um, a vector can be something more than just a line with direction and magnitude or even at then a um, ordered list of numbers. So how do we do this? Well, so throughout the course so far, we've been talking about vectors, right, as these ordered lists of numbers, right, so of length n, so a vector of length three would just be three numbers. And we've sort of been talking about the properties that these vectors have. Um, so we, we quantified how we can add and subtract vectors uh, we quantified how we can multiply vectors by scalars. Um, and so uh, it turns out that if we sort of quantify those properties, like collect those properties and say, okay, these are the properties that vectors possess, um, we can actually find other sets of mathematical objects which, when defined sort of appropriately, possess the exact same properties as vectors. And so we'll see an example of that here in a second. But what I want to do now is sort of define this thing called a vector space, um, which will sort of do what I'm talking about in a sense as abstractly as possible, try and describe exactly what is going on when I look at the standard types of vectors that we're used to looking at. So. Uh, this is going to be, um, I think, a really fun video. Uh, we're sort of putting on a new hat, so to say. And so I figured I would wear my uh, really fun hat for this video. Um, so a vector space is a non-empty set of objects called vectors. So again, anything in a vector space is a vector, and as we'll see, Vector spaces can be um, fairly abstract. So in this space, we have two operations called vector addition. So this is the process of adding vectors. And you might sort of relate this back to how we added vectors in Rn, although, again, the set we're looking at now might not be Rn. And scalar multiplication. And so this property is where we multiply some vector in our vector space by a scalar. And so what we um, sort of require is that these two properties of vector addition and scalar multiplication, or sorry, these two operations of vector addition and scalar multiplication are subject to the following 10 properties. The five properties on the left here concern vector addition, and the five properties on the right concern um, the scalar multiplication. So. While discussing these properties, we're going to assume that u, v, and w are vectors in our vector space v, and c and d are scalars in just the real numbers. So c and d are just any real numbers. All right, so for v to be a vector space, the five additive properties it must satisfy. Well, first off, the sum of two vectors must itself be a vector. This one seems trivial, right, because of course, with the vectors we've worked with so far, the sum of any two vectors, say, of length 3, gives me a new vector of length 3. right? And that's really all this property is saying, is that like, if I add these two things together using this operation, I shouldn't get something completely new. right? Like the sum of two vectors of length 3 shouldn't give me a vector of length 11, or some, you know, something like that. And Again, this one tends to be a little tricky, and, and we'll see some examples moving forward of where number one actually can, can be broken quite a bit. Uh, two, uh, vector addition should be commutative. We've seen that hold with our standard vectors. Um, in math, when we add things together, we like addition to be commutative. That is, I should be able to do it in either order. Vector addition should be associative. Um, again, a straightforward sort of property we like to require when we're adding things together. Four, there is what is called a zero vector in our vector space V. And that is, there should be a vector that when added to any other vector, 
it doesn't affect that vector at all. So here the zero vector will usually just be denoted by zero, and we'd say zero plus v is equal to v. Again, we've seen that the vector containing all zeros in our sort of vector spaces we've seen so far is just the zero vector. Finally, there is what is called an additive inverse. Um, and this should be true for every vector uh, u. So it should also be true for v and w. We're just using u here sort of as the stand-in to talk about what an additive inverse is. And so what this is is some vector so that when I add it to vector u, I get the zero vector. Um, and you might sort of already be picturing in your head what the additive inverse looks like in Rn. Um, again, if I have, like, say, the vector 1, 1, 1, its additive inverse would be negative 1, negative 1, negative 1. Um, and so I think, actually, this happens pretty much all the time, if not all the time, that the additive inverse of a vector is just always, no, it actually is all the time. Uh, that the additive inverse of a vector is just always that vector multiplied by negative 1. Um, and so we might be able to prove that, or we probably will prove that actually uh, later on. All right, so these are the five properties that have to hold with addition. Uh, basically, if I perform this operation, I should still get a vector in my vector space, and then it should satisfy basically, I mean, looking at these, all of the properties that we would expect mathematical objects to satisfy when we're adding them together. All right, so scalar multiplication is much sort of the same. Um, first off, if I multiply a vector by a scalar, the thing that I get back should still be a vector in my vector space. Uh, that is, if I multiply a vector of length 3 by some number, again, I shouldn't get a vector of length 11. Um, so 7 says that I should be able to distribute scalars across sums. We've seen that one before. Um, 8 says that I should be able to distribute vectors across scalar sums. Uh, so that is, if I have a sum of two scalars, I should be able to distribute this vector u. 9 says that if I uh, multiply u by vector d and then by vector c, basically the order of this multiplication doesn't matter. Um, and we've seen that again with standard vectors. Finally, 10 says that if I multiply my vector u by 1, I should get u back. And so for that reason, sometimes we call 1 the additive identity. And so like I said, I think 7, 8, 9, we've actually described as you know, properties that hold about vectors in Rn. Uh, same with 2, 3, 4, uh, 5, and 10. Also, you can see how that holds. And so you might be able to notice, again, how these 10 rules sort of summarize how vectors in Rn work together. But as we're about to see, there are actually other types of sets of mathematical objects, objects we can define that possess these same properties. And so those sets are going to be called vector spaces, and the things in those sets will be called vectors. So again, um, you know, when we say vector now, we don't necessarily mean something with uh, you know, direction and magnitude or a list of numbers. A vector could be almost anything. And to see that, we're going to now look at an example of a vector space. All right, so I claim that the set of all polynomials of degree at most 2 is actually a vector space. So we're going to say P2 be the set of real valued polynomials of degree at most 2. And so what does that look like? So objects in this space that is, real valued polynomials in degree at most 2. Um, so here, in this space, vectors are of the form n 
ax squared plus bx plus c, where a, b, and c are real numbers, not rn, just r. So again, this is sort of the general way of writing a polynomial of degree at most 2. Um, you know, it has x squared term, x term, constant term. Uh, in particular, notice that um, a, 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 B, and C could all potentially be 0. So I'll give a few examples of polynomials that are actually in this space. We could have something like 5x squared minus 2x plus 1. We could have something like 3x, or even maybe a constant polynomial, like just 1. Because notice here, a would be 5, b would be negative 2, c would be 1. Here, a and c would be 0, but 3 would be, or b would be 3. And here, a and b would be 0, but c would be 1. And so all of these polynomials are in my space. But because we're going to show this is a vector space, all of these polynomials in this context are vectors. So how do we define this as a vector space? Well, so addition will just be defined as normal polynomial addition. So for example, p1 of x plus p2 of x is equal to 5x squared minus 2x plus 1 plus 3x, and then we just add like terms. So in this way, there's sort of a natural way to define polynomial addition. And scalar multiplication Well, I might multiply, you know, negative 2 times my polynomial. So I'll define it a little more generally. So for example, negative 2 times the vector p1 of x would just equal negative 2 times the entire polynomial. And so this multiplication would have me distribute the negative 2 all the way through the polynomial. So we define vector addition in this case, or just as polynomial addition, where I add like terms, and scalar multiplication as just sort of normal, uh, the normal way how we would multiply a real number times a polynomial, where I just distribute it through each of the terms. But to show this as a vector space, I have to be able to show that the 10 properties I listed all hold in general um, for any sort of pair of polynomials or pair of polynomials along with scalars. So uh, to, to finish out this, this lecture, we're just going to show uh, by going through the rules and sort of showing each step that in fact P2 is a vector space under this type of addition and this type of scalar multiplication. So the um, very important thing to note here we need to be as general as possible when showing these things. So if I want to prove that P2 is a vector space, I have to be able to show that for any arbitrary polynomial I pick, that these properties hold. So I'm going to let P1 of x now be defined by a1x squared plus b1x plus c1, P2 of x, be a 2x squared plus b2 of x plus c2, p3 of x be equal to a 3x squared plus b3 of x, or b3 times x plus c3. And so notice I'm defining these to just be completely arbitrary polynomials. And what that means is that I don't know exactly what these I guess technically nine constants are, but we're going to show that no matter what they are, all of these properties are going to hold. And so that will show that all of the 10 properties that I need to prove hold in general for my polynomials. So we're also going to let D and E be scalars. 
and let's prove this is a vector space. So um, I'm just going to walk through each property in order. Um, we'll talk about it a little bit. As you'll see, some tend to be easier than others, um, and some will actually just follow immediately from sort of the natural properties that real numbers possess. So what we need to verify first is that a sum of any two arbitrary polynomials of degree 2 is itself a polynomial of degree 2. And so what that means is that um, I want to be able to add these two polynomials together and show that I get a structure or sort of a polynomial that I can write in a very similar structure. So this sum is equal to a1x squared plus b1x plus c1 plus a2x squared plus b2x plus c2. So notice I've just replaced each of these polynomials by their um, expanded counterparts. But notice, again, each of these is just a real number. So I can add these by adding like terms together. And so this gets me the following polynomial. And notice now, I've got some constant times x squared plus some constant times x plus some constant uh, times nothing. And sure enough, this is itself a polynomial of degree 2. And so this is closed under addition. All right, next up. Well, here we need to show that polynomial addition is commutative. And again, this just follows from the fact that addition of real numbers is itself commutative. And so notice here, I just want to move all of these terms around. But again, since here, since addition of real numbers is commutative, I can move these terms around however I want. C1, which is equal to P2 of x plus P1 of x. So you might sort of be seeing a trend with how we're going to do this. We're often going to be falling back on mathematical principles that we know to be true. Um, and so oftentimes, there aren't going to be too many of these verification steps that are extremely difficult. right? Like this one, you can just say, well, real number addition is commutative, and ultimately polynomials are just sums of real numbers, and so polynomial addition is also commutative. Um, and so much in the same way, um, property three follows um, just from the fact that, again, polynomials are real numbers, and so we immediately get that p1 of x plus p2 of x plus p3 of x well, notice here, we're just adding a bunch of real numbers together. And since we can do that in any order, I can just move the parentheses as I see fit. All right. So three is maybe not as interesting in this case. Um, four, we need to show that there is a zero vector in this space. I claim the zero vector is just the polynomial p of x is equal to 0. Why is this the case? Well, notice that p1 of x plus p sub 0 of x is equal to a1 x squared plus uh, b1 x plus c1 plus 0, which is just equal to the polynomial p1 of x. So sometimes, you know, we actually weren't given, you know, if I needed to show this as a vector space, I wasn't actually given, you know, this polynomial being defined the zero polynomial. So 
you know, one thing you might want to note here is that um, is that as I'm sort of writing the next um, thing is that sometimes you'll actually have to like look at you know okay what is the specific property that I want to show about the zero vector and then you know say okay what is the polynomial which possesses this property um, and you know often it'll just be sort of you know the thing in the space that corresponds to zero uh, but keep that in mind like you know you, sometimes you have to do a little bit of searching for you know exactly what that thing is all right so uh, here I claim that the additive identity or sorry additive inverse again we need to find given this polynomial p1 of x we need to find the corresponding polynomial such that when I add it to p1 I get 0 and so I'm just going to define this to be negative 1 times p1 of x which is just the negative of all of the coefficients. And now we check, does p1 of x plus negative p1 of x equal 0? Well, notice that again, I can add like terms. And so I'm going to get a1 of x squared minus a1 of x squared, b1 of x minus b1 times x. Sorry, I keep saying of x. And then c1 minus c1. And so sure enough, that equals 0. And so you've got the additive uh, inverse property as well. And so it satisfies 1 through 5. Again, polynomial addition in this way works sort of just like vectors work. Um, the secret, which I'll tell you now, is that we're actually going to show later on that polynomials themselves can sort of show to just be vectors if you look at them the right way. But anyways, uh, we need to show properties 6 through 10 now. All right. So property 6, I want to show that if I multiply any scalar d times my polynomial p1, that I still get a polynomial in the um, original space. And so notice here, I'm just going to distribute d through this polynomial. And this one will work much like property 1 worked uh, concerning scalar, uh, or sorry, uh, vector addition. I have to show that when I do this scalar multiplication, I still get a polynomial of degree 2. And rearranging things around, we can see that is true. All right, so next we need to verify that d times p1 of x plus p2 of x, well, I should be able to distribute this d through. So to see that, I'm just going to write this out in full. And notice, again, I have the distributive property with real numbers. And so I can actually distribute my scalar d through this entire expression. But what I'm going to be able to do after that is sort of undistribute, in a sense, the d in a useful way where I can undistribute it sort of splitting the equations in two. And notice that I show property 7. Just like so. So notice I've shown that I can distribute a scalar through by just sort of distributing it, working with real numbers in the way that we know how to. And then uh, I guess I called this past couple steps undistributing. So um, property 8, um, as we'll see, uh, actually is, is proven in the same way as um, property 7. So 
what we can show is since polynomials contain real valued terms, Uh, it follows that for any two scalars, d plus e times p1 of x, that again I can sort of distribute in this way. Um, I have the full I have the full proof for this written out in the uh, worksheet solutions, um, much like for number seven. But it ends up going sort of the exact same way, where you distribute through and then undistribute. Uh, so try it on your own, actually. Try showing this, and then you can check the full. Uh, solution to this in the worksheet, but um, I won't show it here just for uh, time's sake to make sure this video doesn't go on too long. All right, um, same with nine. So nine cents, uh, we can just say by the properties of real numbers. And you can see a solution to 9 as well in the worksheet, but you can show that basically if I have a polynomial multiplied by e, and then I multiply by d, I can rearrange the terms in a way so that d e times p1 of x is the same. Um, and again, there's sort of a full solution to this much like 7 in the worksheet, um, uh, but just to make sure the video doesn't go on too much longer. Um, I'll leave this sort of as an initial exercise, and then you can check the, the full solution there. Uh, but again, note it, it is very much the same as, as 7, where you sort of just work through this to show that everything works out. Um, and finally, notice if I multiply any polynomial times 1, Well, this is just equal to the original polynomial. And so it turns out that the set of polynomials of degree 2 is actually a vector space. Um, so um, like I said, check the worksheets for uh, full expanded solutions to these two properties. Um, but try it on your own first. Try sort of mimicking what happened in 7. Uh, to show that 8 and 9 both hold. Um, then in the worksheet, there's one more problem where you actually will show that it turns out matrices can form a vector space as well. Uh, and then we will move on to uh, section or video two of this uh, chapter. Uh, and so one more quick note. Um, so by the schedule, you will be uh, watching this on Wednesday. And so you have a midterm tomorrow. Note again, this will not be on your midterm. So uh, you don't have to worry about mastering this uh, by tomorrow.